all for sticking with us as we move through this uh, intense program today. That was a great discussion of the policy options that Brazil may be able to consider and hopefully also that many of its, its partners will consider as well because this is something that there's a lot that can be done here, but there's a lot that uh, countries must work on together. So we look forward to seeing more progress on that in the future. The next stage in our program is our keynote speaker, Mr. Uh, Rogeria Sudart, who currently serves as the alternate executive director to the World Bank Group, representing Brazil, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Haiti, Panama, the Philippines, Suriname, Trinidad, and Tobago. So quite a portfolio that he has. He is a member of the Committee on Development Effectiveness and chairman of the G24 and represents Brazil at the IDA 16 replenishment meetings. Prior to his current appointment, Mr. Sudart served as the executive director of the same country, same country constituency. As executive director, he was a member of the budget and personal committees and chairman of the ad hoc committee on rules for the 2008 regular election of bank and MIGA executive directors. He also served as vice chairman of the G24 from March 2008 to October 2009. Prior to his appointment as executive director, he served as the executive director for Brazil and Suriname at the Inter-American Development Bank and the Inter-American Investment Corporation. From 2003 to 2004, he worked as financial market specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank. He's previously also held positions with uh, UN ECLAC, UN CTAD, and the Brazilian Institute of Statistics and Geography, as well as Chase Manhattan Bank in Brazil. He is an economist by training and holds a PhD from the University of London. He has published many articles and books on uh, macroeconomics, finance, and development finance. He also holds a professorship with the Institute of Economics at the Federal University here in Rio de Janeiro. So I will invite uh, Rogerio to take my place up here at the podium, and he will deliver his remarks to you all. Please walk in. Thank you. I was almost getting afraid that you not mention the fact that I'm an associate professor at the University of Rio, uh, which is the part that I'm most proud of in my CV. So but let me start by saying that I, even though my title is executive director, uh, I, am, uh, I represent Brazil and, and eight other countries at the board of executive directors of the World Bank. <coughs> and having said that, uh, what I'm going to say here is just my personal uh, opinions. I want you to thank uh, uh, Raynan and, and your team, and GFI, for hosting this uh, excellent conference and for, this, uh, for allowing me to learn a lot about the subject. And minds, of course, and for you all to be here and listen to what I have to say. Uh, when Raymond invited me, to talk here, I told him that even though I'm a, a macroeconomist and I've, I've done uh, some work on financial flows, I did not understand anything about illicit financial flow. Having you know, thought about that, it's, it says something good about me. But uh, uh, and but he agreed that I came, that I come, and he asked me to come. So I I just want to tell you a little bit about what I've learned from reading the report from reading all the reports and from listening to you, what are my main conclusions here? First of all, I, of course, I was very, at the, at the same time, I was, I'm, I, I was very concerned with the numbers I saw about illicit financial flows from Brazil. We're talking about 30 something in the past three years, billion dollars a year. That's, that's a lot, it's a huge amount of money. We should be concerned about that for at least two reasons, the, the issue of tax uh, evasion, which is really important for us, but also because of the reserves that we are losing, and we need that res those reserves very much for reasons that I'm, I'm going to be discussing now. On the other hand, uh, how long do I have? 
I have 30 minutes. I can talk about my whole life in 30 minutes. Okay, let's start here. Uh, the, the other thing is that we, we have a little fruit here in Brazil called jabuticaba. Whenever you want to say that nothing, it, it's, it's only, you only find it in Brazil. It's, it's perhaps one of the only unique things that Brazil has. And whenever you want to say that it's, it's not unique in Brazil, we say it's not a jabuticaba. So, uh, the, so my first conclusion is that the case of illicit financial flows uh, in Brazil is not, a, even though we have to be concerned about that, is not a jabuticaba. Uh, the second thing is that it is, it, if it's a global systemic phenomena, we have to understand it from both uh, the economic and the, uh, the political point of view to see how to address it. The third thing that I, I learned is that there's no way for you to combat this issue from a national level. It has to be a multilateral effort. I, I prepare very quickly a, a, a presentation here. I hope that you, you, don't, you don't mind that. This just to give you some, uh, so some evidence what uh, uh, I should have produced more of that, but that but I think that uh, some of the slides is we'll be able. First, can, can, do I have control here? Yeah. Okay, first, uh, as I said, I don't, think, I don't think that the case of Brazil is a Bachabuchicaba, it's not unique, but we should be, be very concerned with it. The numbers that you show to us are quite astonishing, quite astonishing. Uh, when you look, particularly in the last, uh, five years, of, and even more in the past three years of your uh, database, uh, you're talking about 30-something billion dollars a year. But then if you look at your other reports on the word volume, you see that from 2002 to 2011, there has been a significant increase of illicit financial flows from developing countries. Uh, it should not be a relief to anyone, to individual countries, but at least it's, it's, it, it, I do not go out thinking, oh, corruption or, or, or lack of governance has become a major endemic problem in my uh, country. It's just a small relief. Now, of course, Raymond, you already mentioned and other have mentioned the fact that this is very much related. This is Fred, I recommend this website for everyone, it's the Federal Reserve. Uh, database it for uh, China and produce that, and it, and 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 this is exports a value of goods for Brazil monthly. It's an average monthly rate uh, rate for each year. So you can see Brazil has gone from a monthly uh, uh, exports of around four billion dollars to around to, to above twenty billion dollars a month in a very short period of time. This has been an incredible uh, an incredible uh, pace of growth. If you think that, let's go back, if you think about the $30 billion, we're talking one and a half month uh, of, less than one and a half month of, of total exports. Should we be concerned? Yes, definitely. I mean, any money being evaded from our tax base or from our reserves should be something that we should be looking very carefully. But if we think that this is a proportion then it makes more, a little bit more sense. And if you look at the Oxfam, uh, uh, the Oxfam uh, report that you have in your, in your, uh, I don't think this is from Oxfam, it's from your own report about what you call Brazil's underground economy. Is that informal economy or underground economy? Okay, no, because it, that may makes it a difference. Because, well, for instance, if we had in, in, in the 970s, 55% of the economy as underground economy, we will be a country of mafiosos. So, the, so I maybe should change that for informal. But anyways, that shows a little bit that that what what has been also good in the case of Brazil, the size of what you call underground economy has been reduced significantly. As a matter of fact, in the uh, after the redemocratization of Brazil, the uh, the level of transparency both of government accounts, 
but also in, in, in many other levels, uh, has been uh, uh, has been has been increased significantly. If you want to know, for instance, nowadays, how much a, a government official is spending today on her or his credit card, you can find it on the website, and you can put together all the fiscal data that you want from the website. It's a, a public available. Not perfect. It could be it could be much improved. But I have to share something with you. I've been abroad and representing Brazil for 10 years. I have seen very little cases that match that kind of transparency. I'm, and I'm not boasting. I think Brazil is a long way from, from being the country of the governance that I desire. But the steps that we have taken from the obscure times of the dictatorship to the times of a democracy have been extraordinary. Now, I, as, as an economist, I've, I've been trying to understand why there has been an overall increase of, of, of illicit financial flows from developing countries. It's not just that corruption has, has increased that substantially. Corruption, I, I believe, has stand in the very high level everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, but something has changed. I, I, have, I, I, I want to share with you a theory about that. Uh, and it has to do with the recent case of financial globalization that we have had, which has been too much based on deregulation, first of all, and also which led to financial, illicit financial flows being much more volatile. That has created instability of in, in many levels uh, in, in macroeconomies, but also particularly in, in foreign exchange markets. Uh, developing countries are particularly vulnerable to that. And if you look at the foreign exchange volatility index, you see that there was a significant increase of that throughout these years. Now, if I'm a, a company and I want to keep part of my reserves, I want you to keep uh, in, in terms of cash, I would prefer to have it in, in a currency that is strong enough that will withstand the volatility of the international markets. So this is, this is what happens. I mean, there's a tendency for the companies to say, where do I put my money as reserve of value that is going to guarantee that I, I'm sheltering myself against this volatility? Now, it, the the I, the 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 this is not has not been just a the 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 flight towards stability has not just be be uh, be has not just been an issue of the private sector. Governments have clearly showed their concerns. We have had several cases of financial instability in developing and developed countries now, unfortunately, and countries like uh, Brazil, for instance, have been increasing is international reserves like never before in order to shelter ourselves against this volatility. So the idea that we live in a more insecure international financial system is not just for the company. And Brazil is not the only country that has been doing that. Several other, I'm sorry, when you look the, 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 the blue line there, which is China, it's not negative. Uh, in the 1980s, is that, that I put in the right side axis because the increase was so significant that you wouldn't be able to see the other ones. But it's very clear from the literature that the accumulation of reserves has, has been done in, on purpose in developing countries in order to shelter themselves from the security of the international financial system. Now, Oh, this is moving with this one. Okay. Now, Brazil is a curious case. We have adopted since, uh, uh, this would take much longer time for me to discuss that, but I think most Brazilians are familiar, familiarized with that. Remember that I said that probably companies are trying to shelter themselves from exchange rate volatility by putting more money outside. Brazil is a different case because we have had a 
appreciation of the currency, uh, even though the volatility of our currency has been, has increased quite substantially. But if you think, if you are a Brazilian, particularly if you're an entrepreneur in Brazil, probably you have, and any Brazilian has heard that, uh, you have in your mind that the real has been appreciated for a long period of time. So I think that you, what will come to your mind is that at some moment, this has got to, be, to, to change. So therefore, you would prefer to maintain part of your reserves of value abroad in order to shelter you from uh, what is possible going to come at some point with the devaluation of the real. Actually, as it's happening since <coughs> to in, in, in since 2000 and, and to, yes, I think to get a better eyes on it. But it's it's bound to happen. I mean, it, it's bound to happen. So it makes a co completely sense from a commercial point of view. The third part that I learned here is that, remember that I said that this, I, I believe that this has to do with financial, the very peculiar type of financial globalization that we have. I'm not against financial globalization. Just think that financial globalization as we had in the recent past has been very, very negative because it had, it, the main pillar has been deregulation rather than having better regulation and better rules of the game. So what the deregulation of the financial, international financial system has done is also to facilitate <coughs> the, the illicit financial flows through the creation of a significant number of, not only a creation of offshore financial sectors, centers, but also allowing much more uh, freedom for companies and financial institutions to move money from one to the other. Okay. And, and there should be to increase this transparency. But it need, we need to do more on that. And I know as a member of G20 that we are doing that. The global, we, Brazil is a signatory of, 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 the, of the global forum. But I think we need to do more. And we have to ask our colleagues from the G20 to use their capacity to influence that more. Now, uh, I cannot see that. When you look, wh when the situation is, it has become extremely, and that's also from, from the Oxfam report, ex when, uh, extremely uh, uh, dangerous. When you see that a significant part of foreign direct investment now is coming from offshore and financial centers. When that happens, it cl clearly shows you that it's difficult. If it is difficult for the G8 countries to have that kind of information for their own international financial uh, uh, offshores, imagine for us to have that kind of information. The same thing applies for that. So uh, I don't need to go there. So my conclusions are there. Uh, uh, from this seminar, which I think very much, I really learned a lot about this, is that first, the increase in uh, illicit financial flows from Brazil are a problem that we should all be concerned here. But it's not an isolated problem. It's not a jabuticaba. Uh, second, as, as I said, it's, it's a matter of extreme concern for moral reasons, I think I, I don't have to say to you that in a, in a community, when you're evading from paying your uh, your taxes, there's a moral issue related to that. But <coughs> but also there are economic consequences for that. I don't think like a, like Leonardo said. I think the economic consequence. I disagree with you. I may be wrong, but we can discuss that. Has nothing. It, it, it is not so much on the on level of investment. Uh, that money sh cannot be used to raise investment. Investment, uh, that's a, a longer discussion. But it does affect our tax base, which is extremely important for sustainable growth, sustainable long-term growth, and also diminish well, our international reserves, which we badly need in order to maintain, to 
to maintain a cushion against the instability of the international financial system, which, by the way, has only increased after the 2008 uh, crisis. Let me mention to you, let me say something to you before I forget that I want you to raise your attention to. Uh, Mario Draghi, the president of the, uh, the European Central Bank, has just declared that the Eurozone is going to adopt a quantitative easing that is similar or higher than the one that has already been adopted by the United States and Japan. Now, the quant quantitative easing and the so-called non-conventional monetary policies in those countries that have hard uh, currency are creating a major danger for the international financial system, but particularly a, a, a potential source of instability in the, in the near future. We need those reserves to cushion ag against that kind of increased potential volatility and the existing potential volatility. So it's a matter of extreme concern, as I said, for moral reasons, but also for economic reasons for any, I wouldn't say even developing country, for any country that, that cannot issue a hard currency, which by the way, can only be done by very few countries. Uh, third, higher forex volatility created higher demand for stability. This is this is a problem. It's uh, it's uh, there has been an increase of there has been an increase of what Keynes would call liquidity preference, but for liquidity in other currencies, this is dangerous. Global financial deregulation made it easier to fly from volatility. And this is one of the underlying reasons why we have those reserves. Should we be concerned, as I said that, uh, for tax evasion reasons and for, uh, and for international reserve reasons? Finally, and that's uh, what I wanted to stress, and as I have done before, curbing illicit financial flows is a, is a matter that it should be of concern of all of us, the G20, but also the international community. It cannot be dealt nationally, bilaterally, it can only be dealt multilaterally. Let me just share with you, uh, Raymond, as part of the multilateral systems that I've been for 10 years, I'm concerned. I'm really concerned that the multilateral actions that, uh, that are needed to address the issues that we're facing now are become even more and more difficult and people are recurring more and more uh, 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 their um, national capacities to address the crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you again for, for this excellent conference, for my learning a lot, uh, and also for bringing this issue to Brazil because I think this is one issue that should be brought not only to the government but the, for the private sector and for the public opinion, and it's an important issue. Thank you.